Hi everyone, and welcome to our lecture on heme synthesis and its related disorders. Heme is a component of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is formed when heme and a protein called globin combine together. And the main function of hemoglobin is to carry oxygen in red blood cells. Heme is mainly produced in the bone marrow, and a small fraction of heme is also produced in the liver, which is used by the cytochrome P450 enzyme. And we'll see later on, when we discuss some of the disorders of heme synthesis, that any substance or drug which enhances the activity of cytochrome P450 enzyme will also lead to worsening of some of the disorders of heme synthesis. Just for a side note, disorders of heme synthesis can be referred to as porphyrias as well. This is our diagram that I'll be working upon in this video. Here's a cell. Over here we have the mitochondria. Outside the mitochondria is the cytosol. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because heme synthesis pathway takes place in both the cytosol and the mitochondria. So let's begin how heme synthesis occur. Glycine and succinyl CoA combine together inside the mitochondria to produce delta aminolevulinic acid using the enzyme aminolevulinic acid synthase. And note that this enzyme is also the rate limiting enzyme of this pathway. It is stimulated by alcohol, barbiturate, and hypoxia, and it's inhibited by glucose and heme. And these stimulators and inhibitors will become much more significant when we'll discuss the disorders in a bit. Anyways, uh, the delta amino levulinic acid which is formed then heads over to the cytosol and is converted into porphobilinogen by the enzyme delta amino levulinic acid dehydrogenase. Porphobilinogen is then converted into hydroxymethylbilane or HMB for short by the enzyme porphobilinogen deaminase. HMB then gets converted into uroporphyrinogen 3 by the enzyme uroporphyrinogen 3 synthase. Uroporphyrinogen 3 then uses the enzyme uh, uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase to become coproporphyrinogen 3. And I'm very sorry I don't make these names up, otherwise it won't be that difficult to pronounce them, let alone remembering them. CP3 then gets transferred into the mitochondria, shifting the cycle back to where it started from. And CP3 eventually gets converted into protoporphyrin. Finally, protoporphyrin combines with iron to form heme in the presence of the enzyme ferrochelatase finishing our cycle of heme synthesis. So this is how heme is produced and now we'll move over into the pathologies associated with it. We'll start off with the lead poisoning. Lead poisoning could occur due to environmental exposure. So when lead is in excess what happens is it inhibits the enzymes delta amino levulinic acid dehydrogenase and ferrochelatase. So these two enzymes are inhibited. And once they are inhibited what happens as a result is that ALA cannot get converted into porphobilinogen and protoporphyrin over here cannot get converted into heme. This leads to a buildup of protoporphyrin and aminolevulinic acid. And clinically, it's very difficult to detect lead poisoning. You may see patients with microcytic anemia, and they will have characteristic ringed sideroblast in the bone marrow. Now, what do I mean by that? See, when iron cannot be combined with protoporphyrin to form heme, because the enzyme ferrochelatase is inhibited by lead poisoning, iron tends to accumulate in the mitochondria and becomes trapped there. So the iron cannot get out of the mitochondria. And what you get as a result is iron containing mitochondria which forms a ring around the nucleus giving the cell the characteristic ringed sideroblast appearance. I suggest you google what ringed sideroblast exactly look like on the histology so you get a clear idea of what I'm talking about. Moving on, lead poisoning can also present as GI or renal disease. Common cause of lead poisoning in children is lead paint exposure which can as a result decrease their mental status. In adults, lead poisoning occurs due to environmental exposure and can further go on to cause symptoms such as headache, memory loss, and peripheral neuropathy. So this was just a quick review of how heme synthesis is affected by lead poisoning. We'll cover lead poisoning in detail in a separate lecture. Anyways, let's move on to our next disorder which is acute intermittent porphyria. It's an autosomal dominant disease it's due to congenital deficiency of the enzyme porphobilinogen deaminase, so this enzyme here is deficient. Normally patients are asymptomatic, which means they don't present with any symptoms. And if they do present with symptoms, they do so in an acute intermittent fashion. Hence the name of the disease, acute intermittent porphyria. The reason why symptoms occur is due to rise in the levels of amino levulinic acid and porphobilinogen. As they are neurotoxins, which means they have the tendency to damage the nerve supply. Adding on to it, ALA and PBG levels can be increased if patients have recently consumed alcohol because alcohol would stimulate this enzyme over here called aminolevulinic acid synthase, 
which will in turn increase the levels of aminolevulinic acid and this in turn will increase porphobilinogen levels and in acute intermittent porphyria PBG cannot be converted into HMB as this enzyme here is deficient. So you're stuck with increased levels of ALA and PBG which can lead to the symptoms of acute intermittent porphyria. Many of the symptoms of this disease have a letter P in common. So you will have pain in the abdominal region. Uh, the urine will be port wine colored because porphyrins change the color of the urine to port wine. Polyneuropathy will also be seen as ALA and PBG are neurotoxins. Psychological disturbances are seen as well. Acute intermittent porphyria are often precipitated by drugs which induce cytochrome P450 enzyme. Now remember in the beginning of the lecture we mentioned that heme is produced by the bone marrow and a fraction of heme is also produced by the liver which is used by the cytochrome P450 enzyme system. So if a patient is on drugs that are stimulating or inducing cytochrome P450 enzyme, the liver would require more heme to be produced so it can fuel the function of cytochrome P450 system. So to meet the increasing demand for heme, the body then stimulates the enzyme aminolevulinic acid synthase, hoping to increase the total concentration of heme. So what happens as a result is that ALA levels rise, which raises the porphobilinogen levels. Now again, since this enzyme is deficient, so ALA and PBG levels continue to rise, leading to the symptoms we mentioned earlier. Another cause is that during starvation, there are low glucose levels in the body, which in turn activates ALA synthase, leading to the above mentioned symptoms as well. And the reason behind this is because glucose inhibits this enzyme. So if glucose levels are low, aminolevulinic acid synthase has reduced inhibition, thereby promoting the pathway. So the take home message here is that anything which is stimulating the enzyme aminolevulinic acid synthase will lead to the symptoms of acute intermittent porphyria. Guess what the treatment of acute intermittent porphyria could be? Well, since stimulating this enzyme was leading to problems, inhibiting it tends to solve our problem. So you can administer heme and glucose to symptomatic patients and heme is just a synthetic form of heme. All right, so we're done with acute intermittent porphyria. Let's move on to our last disorder, which is porphyria cutanea tarda. In this disorder, there is deficiency of the enzyme uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase. So this enzyme here is deficient. This as a result leads to the buildup of uroporphyrinogen, which gets oxidized into uroporphyrin and uroporphyrin can get excreted into the urine giving it a tea color. Uroporphyrinogen also accumulates in the skin and when exposed to light results in blistering skin lesions, hence the name of the disease Porphyria cutanea tarda. Causes of this disease are alcohol, hepatitis C, HIV, and all of these result in some sort of damage to the liver. Treatment is phlebotomy. The idea here is that in patients with Porphyria cutanea tarda, when you perform liver biopsy, what you find is that they have excess iron. So when phlebotomy is performed to remove the excess iron, it is also seen to improve the function of the liver, where a fraction of heme is also produced. Patients are advised to avoid exposure to the sunlight because uroporphyrinogen tends to accumulate in the skin, which can cause blistering skin lesions when exposed to sunlight. Hydroxychloroquine is a malaria drug that can also be given as a treatment. It's known to improve symptoms, however, the mechanisms are still unclear. That finishes off our lecture. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like and make sure to subscribe to our channel and turn on the bell icon so you do not miss any future updates from us.